this morning I want to bring to you this charge that uh, was given under the Hebrews. And as you can see, it covers quite a bit of ground here. So we're just going to have to hit the ground running this morning to be able to, to keep up with these things. Uh, this, is a, this is a summary, if you will, of the gospel. This is, there's a lot packed into a few words right here. And I'm going to go ahead and read the text again for the recording. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and a living way which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Amen. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Amen. So firstly, this morning, having therefore, brethren, boldness. I want to tell you this morning, brethren, that you do have boldness in Christ Jesus this morning. Uh, this boldness, as we talk about it, it's not a rashness. It's not a, a rude violence. It is a robust assurance. This, this boldness that we have. It is a sure and a confident stance that we have before God. It is to approach God with the knowledge of what He has done to make us accepted in His sight and to enter into it, to, to be willing participants in this, this favor that God has given us. Yes. Amen. It is an incredible thing, brethren, that we can even consider this this morning, that we can have boldness in the presence of very God, that, that this God who is... We're talking about a God who is holy, holy, holy... Yeah. We're talking about a God who is a consuming fire, a God who, who will by no means clear the guilty. This is the God we're talking about, yet we can come before him boldly and confidently. This is an amazing consideration. Just this itself is, is a, a, a commentary of the effectiveness of Christ's blood, that his blood did what the, bulls, the blood of bulls and goats could never do. Uh, the, in another place, the apostle testifies of this access that we've been granted. He says, according to the eternal purpose, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence by the faith of him. And earlier, even in this, uh, this book in Hebrews 4, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Boldness. Now, in uh, 1 John, he affirms that this boldness will it'll actually even extend to the day of judgment. Uh, herein our, is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. So this is, this is our assurance that we'll be able to abide the day of his coming. So then those who are in Christ, we ought to be a bold people. We really ought to. Uh, people who are not ashamed of the access that they have been granted unto the Father. Uh, uh, knowing that, that we can approach our God without hindrance, this actually gives us confidence to be bold in the face of our enemies. Uh, we know that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. So we can have boldness in this stance. We can, we can boldly face opposition. We can boldly address error and wickedness uh, and boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we see this lived out in, in the lives of the apostles. This is what uh, the people said about them when they saw them. They said, now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they've been with Jesus Christ. Amen. So, so I, I don't think we're seeing a whole lot of this in, in our day at large. I, I don't know any people who, who look at the, the um, condition of the present church and say, oh, those are some bold people. They must have been with Jesus. You know, but but I'm telling you that this can happen. It can. See, uh, the, the, the ch if the church stops pandering to the culture and if the church stops co compromising on issues of truth and creating their own man-made programs and plans and all these other things in 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 uh, um. The, instead of the gospel, then this can happen. If, if they, they have added something to it, they, they have not just come out and said, well, we don't think the gospel is enough. But by, by, by doing this, this is what they've done. They've added to it. They are, in, in doing this, they've actually shown that they are ashamed of the gospel. If they would get up and boldly declare unashamedly the gospel of Jesus Christ, this would happen. Well, I tell you this morning, brethren, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation unto everyone that believeth. This is the truth. 
Now, the affirmation that's about to be made in the next section of our verse, it does have real power when it is preached and expounded. This is the message that has the power to change people. We have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. He continues uh, by uh, making a, a connection in, ac- in our access in contrast to the lack of access in, in the, the prior covenant. He says, By a new and living way which he has consecrated us for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. Now, in the old covenant, not just anyone could enter into the holiest of holies. That's right. They didn't have people just wandering into there from time to time. There was a separate, a real separation that was marked by that curtain. Uh, the only one who was allowed in there was the priest, and it was one time a year, and it was to make atonement for the people. And when he went in, there was a remembrance of sins every year. But when Jesus was on that cross in the final hour, when he had cried again with a loud voice and yielded up the ghost, behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. See, that separation which had been there for centuries and centuries, the, the way of coming before God with a, a remembrance of sins every year, that was the end of it. It abruptly ended then. The way was opened. And even more than this, we know that the, the, um, the great people burst out of their graves. It was like an explosion of life that couldn't be it couldn't be hindered it it, it had it couldn't be contained and every time we come to him now there is a remembrance of forgiveness yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, where the, once there was a constant need for sacrifice and there was a constant reminder of guilt there's a constant reminder of the removal of the yeah, guilt yeah. And, and there's a constant reminder that Jesus has paid the cost that he has made the atonement so this, this way is a new and it's a living way. It, it is new in contrast to the old. It is, it is not a way of works of righteousness that we have done. It is not a way of sacrifice and ritual. It is a way of life. It is a way of peace with God. A way of holiness and righteousness. A way of fellowship with God and the Spirit. And it is a way that He has consecrated for us. You see, Jesus has not impersonally opened up a way. He has authored it. He has uh, inaugurated it, initiated it, so to speak. He, he, so much as He involved in the path that has been set before us, those who would come to God, un, unto God by Him, that He Himself is the way. It's not on the same wise as the old. It's not a covenant between God and man where, where man must fulfill their end of the covenant for it, for, in, in order for it to be able to happen. It's a covenant between God and Christ. And it is, it is communicated to mankind. The, the fulfillment of the covenant is a guarantee. All we must do is keep ourselves from anything that would prevent us from obtaining it. Oh, and, and press forward to do so. See, the, the way is made clear and the things that we need to be able to travel on this way, they're provided. It only remains that we walk in the way. Amen. So then, having uh, this boldness to enter into the holiness and having a high priest over the house of God. Now, when we're talking about the high priest that we have, again, it's not like the high priest that Israel had. That man was one of them. He, uh, he, that man was one of them, but he was merely one of them. He was a man, but he was only a man. He was a representative of the people who himself needed to be sacrificed for. Uh, he was himself imperfect. If the high priest sinned, if the high priest didn't perform the sacrifice correctly, then the atonement wasn't made. It's not like this in the new, brethren. See, Jesus is the most adequate personality to fulfill his office. He's the only one who could have been a merciful and a faithful high priest unto God. And this is because of two, uh, uh, because of at least two important qualities. Firstly, that he is God. That he was previously, um, up until his time of his incarnation into the world as a man, he was with God and he was God. That the, the, the worlds were actually created by him. That he had worked with God in the creation and throughout the ages prior to his coming on the earth. And uh, he, he had worked as a part of the Godhead, closely and intimately with God. And um, when he did come to the earth, he only did the things that pleased the Father. 
Even the, the father testified, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, he, he fulfilled the will of the father and he did what he was sent to do. So he is in the perfect standing with God to serve as our representative. That There is no uh, personality who could possibly be closer and more favored with God than the beloved in whom we have been made accepted. Amen. And secondly, he is a man. He is, as the scripture describes him, able to be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now this is an important thing. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not a high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but he was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. So he learned, how, he learned these temptations. He learned how to overcome sin so that he could teach it to us, so to speak. So he understands what it's like to be weak. He knows what it's like to be tired and to be tempted. And he actually knows what it's like to be in an environment that militates against godliness, but, but to overcome it. So he is our, our perfect representative in this aspect. That we know that when we come unto him, he will be merciful unto us. Because he knows our frame. He actually knows what we need when we need it. He, he's, he's paid the price to obtain these things, the, uh, to what was required for us to be at peace with God, and he's able to distribute the resources that are required for us to walk in the way that we've been set. This is why the apostle was able to say in the second chapter of Colossians, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. Yeah. And there is nothing that you need that is not, cannot be found in Christ Jesus. You are complete in Him. So then let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. So having heard what we just heard about this new and this living way that's been opened up, the advocate that we have on high to be able to minister these good things, the uh, apostle exhorts us with this charge, let us draw near. Now, this is the stance in which we walk in the new covenant. It's like it's a, a, a state of continual drawing in. We're always being brought to a point of a more full, fuller and glorious fellowship with our God. We've been brought near in the sense that we've been made partakers of the divine nature. God's nature is within us, and our lives are hid with Christ in God. And we have had our minds renewed. We've been given new affections and desires. We've been given a heart of flesh. And having been brought to this place, we are actually willingly and joyfully embarking upon a quest for glory. See, we have tasted and we have seen that the Lord is good. And we're, we're uh, um, maintaining our appetite for these things of God that we've been giving. See, we're setting our affection on things to, above. We're, we're, we're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Our whole lives are characterized by this, by this drawing near. And we recognize that it is, it's our appointed end to be forever with the Lord, and we're doing everything we can now to be able to, uh, be, be able to get up to speed to that end. Uh -huh. Amen. Now, I tell you this morning, brethren, that anyone who professes to know the Lord, if they are not this very day pressing in, if, if a man is not actively drawing to the Lord, it is because they're not believing. At some point in time, unbelief has entered in. They don't believe that the Lord has really taken away all of their sin, that he has really reconciled them unto himself in Christ Jesus. Uh, maybe at one time they did, but at some point unbelief has entered in and it has prevented them from coming. It's put a wall up in between them and the Lord and, and uh, in some instances is one that's not even there. They have fallen for the prey and the deception of the wicked one to, to, to believe these things that aren't even true. If there is something there, it's a, if there's a roadblock between you and God, it's because you have put it there. See, because either you've let something in or you've not believed what God has done. is ne what he's, You don't believe he's done what is necessary to take it away. So the apostle addresses this in our text when he tells us to draw near with a true heart. If you are in Christ Jesus, don't allow the wicked one to trick you into thinking there is anything that can keep you from your God. Amen. There is no reason why you cannot come to the Lord this, small, this morning in full assurance of faith, confidently and boldly knowing that you will be accepted by Him. See, Jesus has paid the price for your sin debt. He has opened a way up to God. If you are in Him this morning, you have been reconciled. You, you, you've even been cut away from and disassociated from the part that caused the offense in the first place. So don't let the wicked one trick you into owning your flesh. 
If he comes to you with a temptation and a fiery dart, you can say, it's not I, but it's sin that dwelleth in me. See, if you're vexed by the temptation, if you can say, oh, wretched man that I am, don't stop there. Recognize that through Jesus Christ, you are going to be delivered from the body of this death. Well, you notice the way that he says that. I like the way he said it. He makes a distinction even in that statement, the body of this death. <laughs> He's not owning it. This thing I have nothing to do with because I've been sanctified for the master's use. If there does come a time when you do trip and fall, if this does happen, if you find yourself having sinned, we admit that this is the uh, exception and not the rule in Christ. We have the promise that if we confess our sins, that he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness to where it won't happen again. So then, we come having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So he speaks of two specific things which we ought to consider um, that will give us confidence in Christ Jesus when we look back unto this. Firstly, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. Now that is an essential benefit which the Old Covenant made absolutely no provision for. A man will not come to God without, without um, fear and drawing back if they're not confident that he will accept them. We see this lived out in the garden in Adam and Eve. As soon as they realized that sin had been committed, it assumed, they knew, they had a, just this feeling that they couldn't come to God. They hid themselves. There's this rift that had formed between them. They could just tell. It was a defiled conscience. In Christ, we can live in an absolutely good and pure conscience before God every day. We can do this. There is a provision for this in Christ Jesus. And our bodies washed with pure waters. He calls us to think back upon our entrance into the kingdom in our baptism. This is a, a, a point of, re, of reckoning that we can always go back to. Uh, uh, that God, through his operation, as you responded in faith, he put you into Christ and cleansed you from all of your unrighteousness. That when you came in, you were absolutely and completely blameless. This is a point that you can look back upon and reason. If God had begun a good work in you, you can... You can uh, be confident that he will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. So then in light of this truth that we've been, we've been cleansed and been forgiven and justified and sanctified, um, all that really remains is that we continue on the pathway that we have been put upon. Amen. And so he exhorts us, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. Remaining in the earth that is unstable as water, we must have a stable path to walk on if we were, we're going to successfully navigate the terrain of this present evil world without falling. So if, if we're to accomplish this, this, we must remain connected to the one in whom stability is found. Amen. Now we can have confidence in our faith that we have been saved and that God will continue to save us, that there is coming a day when we will be finally and eternally saved and brought into the heavenly kingdom. Now this is the solid rock that we cling to. This is something that has been considerably confused in our day, the question of how can you remain steadfast and immovable in your devotion to Christ and the environment in which we live? How can we remain and continue despite the ungodliness that is all around us and the enemies that are assaulting us from without and within? And the answer is this. We can only remain stable by anchoring ourselves to something that is stable. It sounds, it sounds pretty simple, but that's the truth. Uh, these divine affirmations, the truth of what has been done in Christ Jesus and what God has promised to those who are in Him, they are incalculably, inca incalculably, I can't say that word. I wrote it, incalculably. They are essential to our stability. I know the word when I wrote it down. I can't say it. You cannot and you will not survive the winds and waves of adversity in this world by having a simplistic view of Jesus and his death. It won't happen. If you think that Jesus died so that you can have a happy marriage, if Jesus died so you can have a good life here and have good finances and never get sick, that in the day of adversity you will fall. If you primarily look for a confirmation of the blessing of God in your life according to temporary blessing, you will fall in the evil day. You cannot at any point allow yourself to, yourself to see salvation primarily as God sustaining you and advantaging you in the present time. 
So you may not have smooth circumstances in this world. You very well may be called to, to endure a fiery trial. You may never in this life see comfort and peace in the flesh. So if, if you rely on earthly confirmation of God's salvation as your primary means of confidence, then you will surely fall by the wayside. So you won't be able to walk the narrow path because the world is not the point. Now, there are, there are those among us in the health and wealth movement of our day who would have us think that we should never have to face any unpleasant circumstances. Now, if this was the truth, let's look at the, the life of the Apostle Paul, right? We've had, I've, I've heard some people tell people who are sick, well, you're just not living in total victory. Well, I guess Paul just didn't live in total victory then, did he? <laughs> He, he, he had a thorn in the flesh, and he sought for him after three extended seasons of prayer. And what did the Lord say to him? He said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to let you have this as a, as a demonstration of my grace in you. <laughs> he... he he, had, he was shipwrecked, he was beaten, he was persecuted. He, he wrote most of what he wrote in the epistles in prison. So how, how can you affirm that this is the case? But fleshly advantage and blessing really is not the point. The eternal purpose of God transcends such a simplistic view of things. See, the reason why he was able to remain stable, to flourish in this ministry regardless of circumstance, is because he had faith in the promise of God. See, this is, the, he actually articulated this, that all things work together for good for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Uh, the working together of things sometimes in the present can't, they seem a little bit contrary, but we know that at, at, at one point in time, we will see all the things worked together. He knew the reason for which he was grafted into Christ, and he knew his appointed end. And this is also the reason why we can have such confidence in these things, because we have the testimony of God concerning this. He has promised. So, um, in continuing in the text, he exhorts the brethren to hold fast, for he is faithful that promised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the promises of God settle us. They, they are like an anchor to the soul. We know that a promise from God, when it has been given to men, it is as good as done. God doesn't exist in time like we do. God exists outside of the realm of time. So when he gives a promise, it doesn't matter how many millennia have gone by. It's just as if he just promised it and he's going to perform it in the next moment. Remember it talked about, um, in 1 Peter I think it is, he talked about those who were scoffers in the last day. And where is the promise of his coming? And he makes this connection to, to Noah that in the self-same day, the day that he had appointed it, that's when the flood happened. That's when the waters overtook them. It, he made the determination, just as he made the determination to flood the earth and it happened, he's made the determination to, to call many sons to glory and that's going to happen. So then, um, all right, the promises of God are, as the hymn writer described them, uh, something that we can stand on. They are sure. They aren't like promises that men give. See, a, promise, a, a man can give a promise and really mean to fulfill that promise, but because of circumstances that are out of his control, the promise won't be fulfilled. We don't have, God is, is in control of everything. So there is nothing that God has ever promised to do that hasn't come to pass. He is able to fulfill his promise. And above and beyond that, God is willing to perform his promise. He is faithful. He's never promised anything that he hasn't followed through with. So um, lastly, brethren, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now, as we walk this pilgrim pathway, we do, so, we do not do so primarily as an individual. We do so recognizing that we are part of a whole. We recognize the significance of the body that we aren't in an island unto ourselves. Um, we have been redeemed as a body. We have all been brought into Christ a as a body. Therefore, we are all related in Christ. We all have the same hope. We are all partakers of the same spirit. We are all called according to the same vocation. God is not primarily calling individuals to glory. He is preparing a bride for his son. See, Jesus is looking forward to presenting unto him a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. 
So with this in mind, as we live our lives in the present, we do so with a lively, lively awareness of the brethren. Well, we, we do so um, realizing that the way in which we conduct ourselves, it does have an effect upon other people. The, a, a provocation is going to happen, whether for good or for evil. So in, in considering one another, we provoke, consider us to provoke unto love and to good works. You see, we are willingly entering into the purpose of God in Christ Jesus in this. We are, we, are, uh, we are willing in the day of his power, so to speak. The Lord has designed it to be worked out in a fashion that all of the individual members rely on one another. And we can all testify of the truth of this in this assembly. We know every time we meet together that the brethren have something that we need. But I want to encourage you this morning that if you have been given to be... Um, effective in any area of ministry if you've been given to do something you have not been given that for yourself alone you've been given that for the edification of the saints you have been given that to be the part of the whole so don't ever think well it's it, it's not as profound as something that brother given said or it's a, a, you know this is something that we've heard before say it be faithful to to use what the lord has given you because that is how you will grow that is right. you, as you use the the ability that the lord has given you then he will increase it uh, and and I, we've all experienced this that We've had something that we've seen, and as we've articulated it in the assembly, that's when it expands, and that's when it grows. That's when we're able to take a, a better hold of it, and we're, the brethren, we're able to benefit the brethren as well. Amen. So this morning, I want to, along with the Apostle Paul in our text, exhort you to take advantage of this boldness that we've been given in Christ Jesus. See, we've been put in a place where there is absolutely nothing keeping us from approaching our God and all good conscience confidently knowing that we are accepted by him so it's it's our it's your business as the hymn writer put it to keep the way clear and let nothing between if, if he has made it to where there's nothing between don't don't put any put anything there that would so let us take courage for the battle knowing that the one who has promised us this eternal inheritance will ultimately make all things work together for our good and that he is able and faithful to perform what he has promised thank you brother Amen.